The Reconstruction Amendments The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution are often referred to as the Reconstruction Amendments. And in this next little video lecture, hopefully, you'll get a better understanding of what these amendments are and why they're called this, and how successful they have been. So in order to understand the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, you have to really understand what was going on in the United States. So think back to when you had American history right after the Civil War. Right, The Civil War is when the nation was pulled apart. Eleven states decided they didn't want to be married anymore and they were going to leave the marriage. And there was a massive war for about four years. Abraham Lincoln said that there's no way that you states, those 11 southern states that wanted to leave, he would not let them leave the marriage. He thought divorce was not an option. So it was his determination to hold the union together. And in the end, he would end slavery as part of his efforts to save the union. So when the war was over, the American South was devastated. Here's an image of area right outside of Atlanta. The railroads are destroyed. The buildings are burned. Everything in the American South had been destroyed. And it was time to rebuild it. So physically, buildings had to be rebuilt. Railroads had to be rebuilt. It would have taken a massive undertaking by the United States government to go into the southern states that left the Union. Remember, not every southern state left, but those that did were pretty much destroyed. So this effort to rebuild physically the South is known as Reconstruction. And it occurs from around 1865 at the end of the war until 1877. So a period of 12 years where the Union, the North, was rebuilding and changing a lot of things that were wrong in the American South. Of course, the South, these 11 states, couldn't do anything about it. They had been defeated. They could object all they wanted. But in the end, they were a defeated power, and they had no choice but to follow along with what the new plan was for the American South. So obviously, the biggest thing that would take place would be ending slavery, so remember the process for amending the Constitution. You need two-thirds of the House of Representatives, two-thirds of the Senate, and then you need three-fourths of the states. As a condition to letting these states back into the Union, they had to have new elections, and this time uh, the people who came would have to vote to end slavery. So in the House and the Senate, the representatives that showed up from these former rebel states needed to vote for the, what we would call, Reconstruction Amendments. So the 13th Amendment ended slavery. So in the original Constitution, there were many mentions of slavery, how they would count slaves for population, the Three-Fifths Compromise, all of that would now be stricken from the Constitution. They would add an amendment to the end of it, saying no slavery in the United States. The 13th Amendment. I remember this one, because one, three, no slavery. It's just an easy way for my brain to remember what amendment ended slavery. So now, no place in this country legally could have slavery, thanks to the 13th Amendment. Even if, say, the state of Alabama would pass a law that said we're going to have slaves, nothing is higher than the Constitution. So all the states in the Union had to obey the 13th Amendment. If Alabama tried to pass that, the Supreme Court would say no, it violates the 13th Amendment. And if they still tried to keep it, keep slavery, the President of the United States would be directed to go and enforce the Constitution in that state. But since all of these states, these 11 states, were beaten and broken, they could not really resist. So the 13th Amendment was added to the Constitution. The other two amendments, which are part of the Reconstruction Amendments, are the 14th and 15th. Congress and the and the states quickly adopted the 14th Amendment, which was a little more controversial. This one gave equal citizenship to every person in America. Former slaves, for example, were now equal. They were to be treated equally, the same as any other person in the country. You were not allowed to discriminate against someone who was a slave, and they must be treated equally by the government 
and by all people in the nation. This one was a very difficult pill to swallow for some people in the American South, and the 14th Amendment will be one that we'll talk about a great deal in this class. It's one that will come up oftentimes in Supreme Court cases in the way that people are treated. If you're not being treated equally because of the color of your skin or because of your gender or something else, you might say that this violates your 14th Amendment protection of the U.S. Constitution. Also, as part of the Reconstruction Amendment was the 15th Amendment. This said that African American men could vote. Right, So no women yet, but only African American men could vote. So the 13th Amendment ended slavery. The 14th Amendment said every citizen is equal. I remember this one by using the idea that 14 is an even number and can be divided equally. It just helps me remember it. The 15th Amendment, uh, African American men, I think has 15 letters. Otherwise, you just have to remember the 15th Amendment let African American men were able to vote. Now, just because these are part of the U.S. Constitution and these new southern states were forced to vote yes on them doesn't mean that they wanted these. They hated these. In fact, states in the South, like Mississippi and Alabama and North Carolina, they would go out of their way to pass laws to try to get around the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Think of it as like a chess match. The federal government would make a move and the state governments would make a move. So the federal government passes these Reconstruction Amendments saying no slavery, everybody's equal, African-American men can vote. What do the southern states do? Well, they don't, they don't want to follow these, so they come up with laws and rules for different towns and states across the American South. These would be known as black codes, often referred to as Jim Crow laws. So states might say, well, okay, uh, African-American men can vote. We can't really stop the 15th Amendment. But here in the state of Mississippi, African-American men are going to have to show us that they can read or write, or they might have to pay a small tax to vote. Of course, they could not afford that. Former slaves could not afford it, or they didn't know how to read. And so this kept African-American men from voting. So technically, the state of Mississippi is honoring the 15th Amendment by allowing them to vote but they've now passed laws that make it difficult for an African-American man to vote. So these black codes or Jim Crow laws were designed to kind of circumvent or go around the Reconstruction Amendments. And these occurred all across the South. So another example might be drinking fountains. Well, they might have a drinking fountain for white people, but they'd also pass a law that said people of color needed to use a certain drinking fountain. And they would say that these two drinking fountains were equal. and Therefore, they're treating people equally as required in the 14th Amendment. So many states and cities in the American South found ways around the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. All after Reconstruction, for a period of about 100 years, from, say, the 1860s until the 1960s, southern states used these black codes or Jim Crow laws to get around the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. And in addition to all of these laws that were passed, they also had kind of secret groups that would terrorize former slaves. So Ku Klux Klan was the secret group, probably the most famous, that wanted to restore the South to this time before the Civil War and keep former slaves powerless. So if, for example, an African-American man could learn how to read or write, and pass literacy tests to vote, or he could somehow get the money to vote. If he tried to vote, maybe that evening the Ku Klux Klan might visit his house, uh, beat him up, beat up his children, uh, burn his house, kill his animals, or worse, perhaps kill him as a way of making an example out of him so that other African Americans would be fearful of exercising their right to vote or trying to become an equal member of society. So in the American South, we had uh, secret groups like the Klan that would operate alongside the laws that were passed by the people of that state to keep African Americans down. So hopefully you're seeing that just because people vote on something doesn't mean that it makes it right or constitutional. 
the people of a state might overwhelmingly say, yes, we want separate drinking fountains. And even though democracy wins in that state, it doesn't mean it fits with the U.S. rule book, which we call the Constitution. And at that point, the Supreme Court has to step in. And when they would declare those laws unconstitutional. So a few years after the Civil War, we'll briefly touch on this next Supreme Court case, and it'll come up later in class, was a Supreme Court case known as Plessy versus Ferguson. This case was in, involved an African-American man in Louisiana who wanted to ride in a certain railroad car for, as a passenger. And of course, the state of Louisiana had said no, you have to ride in your own separate car. So uh, this was all part of a, an effort to bring this to the Supreme Court. And so this case comes before the Supreme Court in 1896. The Supreme Court decides that the state of Louisiana had not violated Plessy's rights to have equal access to the railroad car. They decided, that is, the Supreme Court decided that having a separate car for passengers or a separate drinking fountain or a separate school or a separate lunch counter was all part of what the Constitution uh, was aiming for. In other words, separate but equal was fine. As long as it was equal, you could have two separate cars or two separate drinking fountains. This Supreme Court case is generally considered one of the worst. It allowed separate but equal in American society. But since the Supreme Court had ruled this way, it would be the law of the land for about 50 years. And so you get this system in the American South where former slaves, African Americans, are living in a different world thanks to the Supreme Court case. And when it finally does come up again before the Supreme Court in, in the 1950s, uh, and the Supreme Court changes its view, you get a lot of anger, as you can see in some of these photos. And I hope you remember this from when you studied the civil rights movement in American history. You know, when the Supreme Court ordered that we can't have separate schools anymore, separate railroad cars or separate drinking fountains or separate schools, the reaction of the American South was very violent. And you're going to see a huge struggle known as a civil rights struggle where white Southerners really, uh, not all white Southerners, but a majority of white Southerners resisted changing the system that had been put in place all through American history, but was validated by the Supreme Court case in 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson. So you're going to see a lot of anger. You're going to see the use of the federal government army to come down and protect students as they try to go to school now that the Supreme Court has ruled that everybody should be treated equally and separate is not equal. You're going to see a lot of violence on the part of uh, the police who are trying to enforce the laws that have been put in place by voters in the American South. Again, because the voters voted for something, it doesn't mean that it fits with the Constitution. Oftentimes, the vo votes of the majority violate the Constitution, and it's up to the Supreme Court to step in and say, what you're doing there is wrong. So just try to imagine how you might feel if you were American citizens who have been denied equal access to Lots of things, education, uh, entertainment, just a quality of life. And now you're being uh, attacked by your community and the police are behind the 100%. So when the Supreme Court rules in 1954, in the Supreme Court case Brown versus the Board of Education, th this case undid the Plessy versus Ferguson case. And it really does strengthen the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments of the U.S. Constitution. We refer to them as the Reconstruction Amendments. We'll talk more about this case and others, and you'll learn more about uh, how uh, the 14th Amendment would be applied more in American history throughout this course.